have Vineet Kumar with us here today, who is the CEO of Native. So Native is one of my favorite brands out there in terms of growth. And PNG recently bought Native for $100 million in cash. So this session is going to be filled with exciting information on what goes on in the mind of CEO, which is Vineet Kumar. And he's here with us today. We are going to understand how you can scale your business, um, Q4 prep, advertising, um, marketing and like everything that you need to know about building a B2C brand. So one more thing, PNG actually scaled um, native for close to 300% or since they have acquired it, which is super interesting. So let me welcome Vineet you all. So hi Vineet, welcome to Q4 Mastery by Seller App. Thank you so well, much thanks. for being here. No pressure, you've, you've, you've built it up so much now, like I've got to deliver against those goods. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that's going to be hard. <laughs> all, right, all right, let's see. <laughs> happy to be here. Happy to answer any questions that you have. Right. So could you introduce yourself? What is Native and who is Vineet Kumar? Yeah, so uh, basically I started off my career at Pre-NG, Procter & Gamble. Uh, so I used to head up the skincare business in Asia uh, for P&G, primarily brands like Olay. Uh, and then about a year and a half ago, I moved over to San Francisco to take over Native. Uh, I hadn't heard of Native, to be completely honest, when I was in, in Singapore because, yeah, it's still a, an upcoming brand. Uh, but it was founded by this gentleman named Moiz Ali. Uh, he's a brilliant guy, uh, very well known and respected in the DTC space in the US. Um, so I took over from him as the CEO of, of Native. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've been over here for a year and a half, loving it. It, it came at a time when there was a pandemic and so many crazy things happening. So <laughs> learned a lot. There were like racial tensions and the US has gone through so much. <laughs> so it's a learning curve for me as well. Uh, I've got a daughter, two and a half. Um, wife is here with me as well. So yeah, loving the life that I'm leading over here. It's so important to love the life that you're living. And I think, um, you know, replacing Mois Ali as a CEO recently must have been so exciting. And I just want to understand more about the change because you worked in PNG for close to 13 years and then moving on from like a whole corporate life to a startup such as Native. How was that change for you? Was it really that exciting? I want to know everything about that. It's scary a little bit in the beginning because you're so used to the structures and the systems and the processes of PNG, right? Um, so, and and I, I can tell you that there are lots of them, and there's a lot of great trainings that PNG has. PNG builds great managers because they teach you how to analyze data, look at things from a strategic standpoint. Uh, so, coming over here, it was a bit of a change because there's a lot more ad hoc, like you know, go with the flow uh, kind of things uh, over here. So I have to adapt my style of leadership a little bit um, to not be like, hey, this is the way I've been doing things for like 13 years. And uh, what can I take from there where, where I bring certain amount of discipline, uh, but also go with the entrepreneurial like, you know, agility that a lot of these small startups have, which is like do learn, do fail fast, uh, those principles. So I think that's something that I have adapted to, but I've also put in some discipline uh, so that at least we know what goals we are going for setting long-term vision and goals so that everyone in the team knows where they're going. Because sometimes what happens is when you're a founder, all the ideas in your head and you've not communicated it enough to like the 10, 15, 20, 30 employees. And as the big org gets bigger, you need to communicate them regularly so that uh, they know, okay, where's this company going? Where is it heading? What is the strategy? So it's not just good to keep it in your head. Um, and sometimes it's okay to be transparent and say, I don't have all the answers and I'll figure it out. So yeah, that was a big learning. That sounds amazing, especially when we're moving in a world where cubicles are like slowly disappearing. And I think that's very tricky uh, to deal with when you're just starting in a startup after working in PNG for 13 years. So I think you've handled it amazingly. So that's congratulations true. on that. I think yeah, my team will be the best people to ask if, in case if they haven't had to say, then you should let me know. <laughs> If anyone from Native is watching this right now, comment down below and let us know how that's going because we would love to see the insights. So, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so coming to pandemic, I have um, I understand that Native is cruelty free. It's simple, it's effective, and you use all clean ingredients in your products, which is amazing because we have seen this wave, especially in the skincare and like you know the beauty industry that we are. Um, conscious of what we put on our skin and like which is also safe for the environment so just to plug in here I've seen your sunscreen which are um, which are zinc friendly which means that they're safe to use for coral reef which yes. is amazing yeah um, so 
as we saw a pandemic last year how did your brand transform and how did your brand adapt to the pandemic and i'm sure that using safe uh, and clean ingredients must have definitely helped you but uh, leaving that aside how did native adapt to um, the pandemic last year so i think uh, the in a way as people were starting to look for products that they can trust and like you know looking looking for things that they they feel are safer for their bodies and the whole idea of like oh you know what that we are one planet and uh, there is no way to escape if something goes wrong actually did help us a little bit because people are like, getting more conscious about the environment more getting more conscious about their bodies and stuff so that definitely helped from a sales standpoint i think the the challenges were too on the back end um, so it wasn't the sales that was the problem the problem was the shift of salience uh, so suddenly you from retail um, a lot of salience moved to online right whether it's amazon or dtc um and handling that change at short notice was a challenge because the supply chains were suddenly cramped up our shipping timelines started when I mean, we used to do it in 3 days it went up to like 15 20 days so we had a lot of irate customers and they were like oh you know what uh, this is crazy we were like where is my order it should have come so there's a lot of managing those changes and secondly keeping all those employees who are doing all the packing in our fulfillment centers you know they had to go through procedures to make sure that they are safe uh right. so that i don't think anyone could have prepared for it uh i think a lot of companies have adapted well to the pandemic i'm surprisingly it didn't collapse actually everyone's like you know found a way uh so i think native did too uh and i think this helped kind of build our resilience to any kind of challenge so if we can go through a pandemic and survive out of it i think you are you can you got the resilience to survive any kind of uh Uh, you know miss out so i think that was one and then we also of course had to conserve our cash uh that's important because you know on one hand you are trying to build inventory because you might think that oh we're going to go out of stock or the global supply chains might get screwed um so we had to manage our cash very carefully so those were the couple of things in the back end i think uh, from a front end standpoint we just made sure that we were sensitive about how, the way we were messaging especially during the peak pandemic time you're not like being happy and joyful and uh, having ads that are like uh, you know too tone deaf you know yeah uh, i've so, seen those yeah so we had to cancel some some out of home placements which we had booked for like millions of dollars we had to change the entire creative in the last minute to be more like appropriate for the kind of environment or like the that was that was going on so i think that those are the main things that we did amazing and i really want to thank you and appreciate your brand for the lgbtqia plus community uh, pride month that you did and i think that was very well done again this is very important and that was a great answer thank you so um moving on we want to understand as you said this is very rightly said that we have to conserve cash and we also have to run very aggressive ppc and advertising campaigns which are quite expensive on, on the peak of uh, you know the pandemic so we are going to get into that just a minute uh, but i just want to talk about the new products that you launched even during the pandemic which was great and i want to understand what was your product launch strategy uh, how did you deal with that and like what preparation if anyone who's watching right now is also selling or planning to launch their new product in q4 what do you suggest they do yeah uh, one is of course the design right like how do you know what product to launch i think there is a lot of consumer collaboration we rely on so uh, a lot of our consumers are very passionate advocates so they actually tell us like you know what i'd like to see uh, you having a hair a shampoo or a conditioner i i would really want a sunscreen or i want a body lotion uh, so there is a lot of uh, consumer feedback that we take to say okay which is the next category we need to go because our mission is basically to reduce the toxic load in the bathroom right so yeah. that's our brand vision like so wherever there is a, a a place where we feel hey you know what there is a way to have more safer ingredients simpler ingredients and more effective uh, uh products we will go into that uh, so our consumers drive a lot of that uh and we look at basically our you know what existing products ex- are there out there and we look at the ingredients and then we say okay which ingredients should we take off that are not really adding value Uh, so so how do we really simplify it and then we have a no list of products saying okay this ingredients will never make it right so that's how we design the products uh and then what we do which is probably what you're looking for is we launch it on dtc in a small uh like a small like say 300 400 prototypes we launch so it's not like software there's a beta version and then those people come back and say okay this is the feedback 
then you have to iterate. So you have to keep iterating like software. And then once you get to a place where the repeat rates are like say, you know, 30%, 40%, you're like, okay, now I'm comfortable making this a, a big launch. And then you launch into like omni-channel. So we have it in retail and, and also in DTC and stuff. So that generally has been our strategy. So Sunscreen, for example, has gotten off to a fantastic start on DTC. Yeah. Um, and of course, there are some feedback that we that, that people have given us saying, you know, um, can I get an SPF 50, uh, for example? And okay, so we're like, okay, you know what? Uh, that's something we probably need to work on in the future. So they will keep giving feedback. We'll have to keep tweaking uh, the product or coming up with a new line. Uh, so that, that generally has been our strategy, um, and of course, from a from a launch support standpoint, of course, Facebook continues to be Facebook, and of course, social continues to be one of the most favored tools for getting new new customers in. Um, yeah, so I think that's how that's how we generally uh, launch new products. So start small, iterate, then scale up with Facebook and uh, other social channels, and then then we expand and launch into retail and Amazon. So, yeah, so I think the two main points from whatever you said just now was listen to your customers. And I mean, they're the people who are going to buy your products and customer insights are super important, especially for brands who are um, looking into consumer centric products such as beauty, health and anything that a cus customer or consumer is going to use in their day to day basis, especially put on their skin and consume it. So um, very important. Thank you so much for that insight. The second thing is you have to be brand consistent. So um, as I understand that native is plastic friendly and I've seen some of the deodorant sticks are um, not packaged in plastic materials. They are completely eco-friendly. They are a cardboard, if I'm not wrong. They're made up of cardboard. Paperboard. That's right, paperboard. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So we launched that actually in smack in the middle of the pandemic. So, but uh, that was our first, like, so we made deodorants, which are completely made of paperboard, right? Uh, and that's actually a good example of one where there, there's a lot of love. So almost 15, 20% of our business has moved to paperboard. That saves a ton of plastic. But if we want to get to 50% of our business or 100% of our business moving, there are opportunities. So some of the consumers have given feedback saying, you know, it's a little bit hard to push up the deodorant. Is there a better mechanism? So then we designed now a refill, which we just launched, uh, like say two weeks back. And again, we launched 200 units and they wiped out. They sold off and sold out in two hours. And now we will wait for the feedback um, to see if people like it. Do they, are they saying this is the holy grail and then we definitely want this? So I think, yeah, that is a good example of something that we launched. It was good, but it was progress over perfection. And now we have to keep getting better at it. Progress over perfection. I love that. And right. um, just I have seen a lot of brands do the same thing, you know, the cardboard or like uh, paper friendly uh, packaging. And I think Native has done amazing with that, especially with no fragrance deodorants as well. So I see that you have taken important trends that are happening in the beauty industry. And then you're making sure that you're implying that to your brand because you understand the consumer behavior, which is happening in the category as well. So um, kudos on that. So right. moving on to uh, branding, I think branding for beauty is so so tricky so how do you create campaigns which include diversity how do you uh, make sure that you know you're targeting all the women types or men of all types and i recently saw a campaign by png um, which was for armpits i think that was wonderfully done so um, how do you include all these things when you're creating a campaign because i understand that it can be tricky because race comes into play body types come into play um, so many things come into play so how do you deal with that yeah yeah so there's two parts to it one is ensuring that you design products for everyone so that uh so that it's not just about i'm going to sell to everyone but making sure that it starts from the design phase so we try and make sure that uh, that whether it's deodorants or the, the hair care we launch or like even sunscreens right the sunscreens the general problem is for a mineral sunscreen for darker color skin if you apply it you get like that zombie face or like that uh, it, it looks like white uh, polish that you put over there white so cast, yeah. Yeah, like my cast is, is bad. And like, so I used to try the products myself, even for hairy arms. Like sometimes if you have like, when you have slightly hair, hair slightly hairy bodies. So then, uh, you know, I used to apply it on myself and see at what level does it, uh, does it make sense. But I think our R&D team did a really good job. Um, uh, um, and actually the PNG R&D team contributes a lot in that, um, in that aspect. Uh, so they came up with a phenomenal formula, which finally was able to reduce that white cast and stuff. So. So from a design standpoint itself, we have to start thinking about men, women, um, you know, different ethnicities, different skin colors and types uh, when you design the product. Then it's about featuring the people in your advertising. 
Yeah. So it it never was like that. But last year I made a conscious call with the team to say, okay, we're going to start featuring different uh, ethnicities. We're going to feature. They actually we were under featuring men. So I was like, this was a reverse gender thing. I was like, we got to feature more men, uh, not just female, because we're we're a genderless unisex brand. Yeah. Um. So. We we started featuring more uh, men in that, and of course there is some backlash. We started featuring people from the LGBT community, uh, families, real families. There is some backlash always. Like I have emails threatening us and stuff for that. Like you know that I would like to see your address and like you know I I don't accept the kind of people you're showing in your ads and this is disgrace. You just gotta like respectfully say that okay, thank you very much, but we are okay not to do with business with those customers who have those uh, mindsets. um so i think we stand very strongly for these um and it's an it's an intentional choice that our marketing team has made to make sure that they include different ethnicities and it's you have to be intentional about it and sometimes you might overcorrect and that's okay like you might feature certain niche groups uh, or uh, fringe groups in your advertising and people will be like okay but that's not your main target that's not the people who are buying you and that's okay because you will have to sometimes overcorrect The only caution to do is not do things for the sake of it. Like for example, there was a director who came to us and said, "Hey, I want to feature a person in a wheelchair." Uh but it had nothing to do with the story. She was just ticking up. She was just proposing it to tick a box. And that can be bad because if it is a story about a person in a wheelchair that that needs to be told, yes, absolutely we should do that. But if it's just doing that to kind of tick a box and look look cool and like kind of like green the greenwashing equivalent, that's not good. So I think yeah. it's about being authentic as well to what your brand yeah. or what is No that is super important and um you know there's something called rainbow washing in the LGBTQIA community which a lot of brands do so yeah please stay away from that um that can get really tricky i did see i'm not sure which deodorant was it but then they uh, modified their packaging it's like a curve so that people who are um you know disabled can you know hold it there is like a better grip on the product and yeah there's so many people um i think one of the products out there i'm i'm not sure if it's what the brand is called but then they have a cap that opens easily for people who have arthritis so um you know you can add people to your group um as if it makes sense to your target audience but just don't do that you know to be inclusive that was very well said and something which is very important to know as well so thank you so much Vinith for answering that question So um now we're moving to the world of or should I say the wondrous world of Amazon. So I understand that Amazon is just one channel for you where you make um sales. So how did Amazon evolve for you in the last couple of years especially last year during the pandemic? Did you see like you know Amazon grew for you as well as a sales channel or maybe there was just a lot of competition? So can you give me some insights on that? No, I definitely Amazon as a channel is growing and that's because of of the the significant convenience that uh, amazon provides right it's it is extremely extremely convenient uh, to find a to find products and b to like the shipping times and like the returns are extremely easy so they they've really mastered e-commerce to a, the nth degree right um so we do have some of our core we don't have all our products on amazon uh we we keep some of our se- current seasonal so we have seasonal like we have fashion like we have we've made <laughs> deodorant like fashion so every quarter we will launch a new collection of scents uh, and then we retire them after like 4 months right so they're gone forever uh, so it's like limited editions launching so some of the past seasons which are still left over a little bit we will put them on amazon so people can still continue to buy it um but uh in the the channel itself has been growing uh for us uh it is absolutely a critical channel for people to try new products in fact people there's a statistic that showed i'm not sure if it's right or not but that 56% of people now start their journey of discovery on Amazon rather than Google it used to be Google search uh, but now a huge number of people are actually looking for the product on Amazon and they may buy it over there or they may read the reviews and they may buy it in the store after they smell it or you know try out like but a lot of the discovery is starting in Amazon so even if your sales are still slow i would say it's a great place for discovery so getting your products out there the right ratings right reviews are very very critical right and um, no i completely agree with that um so 
as a customer on Amazon, we see that you know customer searches for a question on Amazon and does not um, you know the search terms are not brand specific. So definitely you know the discovery part of it is on point. I would say when it comes to searching on Amazon. So what suggestion would you give emerging brands um, who are just starting to sell on Amazon to beat the competition, especially something like Native, which is selling in such a niche category, which is so saturated. So hmm. how would you deal with that? Yeah. Yeah, so I think definitely paying attention to the category search keywords that really matter for you. So don't go spray and pray and like just go to the, the most expensive term, which might have huge number of competitors. I think it's important to start with where you think you have a niche but a big enough niche. So I think leveraging a lot of data tools uh, out there. There are lots of Accelerac, for example, is is, uh, is a great example of a of a tool that uh, enables that uh, to to find which are the ones that you really want to start with, right? Uh, because you will have limited budgets and you don't want to like blow all your cash on a bad ROAS. So you so for example, Native started with only playing in aluminum free deodorants. Like that was the key term that we would play in. Then as we got bigger, then we were like, okay, we are winning most of it. Let's expand to natural deodorants. Then we said, okay, now natural deodorants also we are like top number one, number two. Uh, then we start expanding into deodorants in general. Uh, so I think you can figure out how to find your niche first if you're a small brand and then start building. But definitely use tools to guide you. There are lots of tools out there, uh, SLR being one of them, um, uh, and which is very effective in, in guiding your strategy. Uh, so you get your best ROAS. Yeah, and I think if you're an emerging brand, data, 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 data is one thing that's going to save you and we do give you category insights um, and so much more. So if you want to start your product research, feel free to go on Seller App and start your product research there because we believe in our data and we do help you find a perfect product for you, find the perfect category for you. So uh, coming to Amazon advertising. So Amazon advertising is one of the biggest ad uh, networks that there are. So Seller App um, themselves, like we have managed $850 million of ad spend. So how did Native go into advertising, especially last year during the pandemic? Because I understand that marketing is something which gets really, really, um, you know, important when you're selling in such a saturated niche category. So, of course, um, the pandemic has happened. You are reserving your cash. So how do you distribute that in terms of, you know, um, aggressive advertising on Amazon and how did Native do that? So we still base it on the right ROAS and uh, customer acquisition costs, right? So. Uh, because the brand building, and maybe this is for brands that are probably selling on DTC and Amazon or plan to have a multi-channel strategy. A brand building happens not just on Amazon, it happens in, in overall, right? So you could still have, uh, you know, great, fantastic ads that are running on social that could drive to DTC or to drive to Amazon. So you could do that, right? But the content really is king over there. So what you put out there, is it resonating? Does it have deep insights? Is it entertaining? Like, is anyone want to talk about it or share it? Uh, right, so I think that's that brand building has to happen irrespective. Um, but just within the the you know the app itself, I mean within Amazon itself, we've prioritized a little bit more on the category key, keywords, and we looked at where the best ROAS is, where we did not we're not seeing the right returns. We scaled back, um, right? So it was a lot of testing and learning, A/B testing. Uh, and we had to, of course, balance our top and bottom line, uh, right, to make sure that we're not bleeding cash, unless you have like a bazillion dollars and your investors don't care, uh, yeah. right? I'm pretty sure you will want to be very prudent about how you, how much sales you're seeing, what are your most efficient keywords, where are you getting the maximum ROAS? Uh, and generally, um, I mean, I'm, a lot of people might not be a fan of this, but I think that I don't want to play too much in branded keywords only because I think it's a tax because if someone's already searching for your brand, maybe the brand building has happened somewhere else and then they've come over here. So I try not to spend too much over there, um, right? Uh, and I know some competitors might come and hijack, but I've seen the ROASs on that. They're paying a crazy amount of money on that. So this is maybe an unpopular opinion, but I've generally prioritized category. We love unpopular opinions here and thank you so much for that insight. Um, did you run video ads as well on Amazon? Yeah, we, we still do. Uh, uh, there is a lot of competition. So I think we see where when the ROAS is good, It uh, but we have certain caps in terms of how much we want to spend on it. Or, uh, Definitely. So if it goes, if the bids go above that, then we're like, it doesn't make sense because ROI is just not there. Amazing. So as a CEO of one of the biggest brands um, such as Natives, 
um how what kind of metrics do you follow i know that revenues um orders and pnl are just one of the metrics that you follow but according to you what should people uh, look at um so yeah definitely revenue uh bottom line the, the cash i mean i look at cash and inventory because uh, that uh, definitely is what pays the salaries and everything else and uh, yeah i look at that uh an important one which might be often overlooked is as as you scale and depends on how many people is org org satisfaction like like what is the organization feeling are they being paid right and you know is there a way to for you to measure that like the like the net promoter score for the organization and people often under like don't look at that enough and that's when you lose top talent um right because sometimes great businesses are built on the back of great talent right so uh, it's not just the founder like as as some as you're scaling you need great talent to help you to scale so that's one we look at um from a from other metrics of the business i definitely look at new users uh so and that's more on the ttc side um how many new users are we getting what's the ltv lifetime value are we growing ltv uh and sacred one for me is customer happiness score so our cs team is held to very very high customer happiness score so when we get complaints and they've resolved it and a feedback form goes out to the customer saying how did they do and uh, we we've, we've kept our bar very very high say we need to get it like a 4.5 above out of 5 kind of rating um so that we, like their happiness is paramount so no matter how big we get we have to keep them really really happy yeah and i think your reviews speak for themselves um native has over 15000 plus five star reviews so um great job there and i think again customer needs to know and needs to understand um you know that the product that they're buying is worth their money so of course a positive review even if you're selling in a saturated and niche category a review is what makes you stand out from your competition as well so thank you so much for answering that question vineet and coming to our last question for today's session um q4 so q4 is the biggest selling season on amazon or not on amazon because of course we have so many festivals coming in and people usually buy a lot of stuff so q4 is one of the most interesting and the most fun part of selling a- as a brand so um how do you prepare for q4 and how does native prefer- prepare for q4 any tips and tricks that you would like to give us um now well how do i see this without revealing anything that's supposed to come but uh, <laughs> i think there is a there is a task force that we put uh together headed by our vp of marketing uh so she she puts together a task force for holiday what we call holiday over here right? it is starting september october november december uh so because there's the whole black friday cyber monday but even before that building up to that there's uh, there's so many activities going on in fact last year i think prime day happened in october as well so uh so uh, you know so i think first is the brand building uh, part of it like so what are you going to bring to the market in that period from an innovation standpoint that's going to knock people's socks off and is it relevant for that period So we last year we launched candy cane deodorant sugar cookie deodorant like you know things that you would not like obviously expect from a deodorant we just like go against the norm uh and people love that they're like oh i want to like you know smell like candy cane like who would want to smell but like people love it they went berserk uh yeah and then i think the the second part of it is making sure your store itself has that the right look the right ui and i don't know if it's on amazon it's not really possible but even if you're a dtc brand or in store do you have the right displays do you have the right uh, store uh, landing page uh, which and uh, like are you having enough gift sets are you sending out emails early enough for people to order so that you you don't have those shipping delays uh, that happen you know end of the year and the costs go up so i think there's a little bit of advanced planning that's required from a logistics standpoint um but definitely the have more fun with the brand give use this opportunity to surprise people uh, how can your brand become a gift for the holidays uh, no matter what brand is it right so i think that would be a a good challenge to give your team Yeah, I um, know you can definitely give the holiday feel to your Amazon listings as well. This is something that I tell 
uh, most of the sellers out there, you can change your product images with like Santa hats and candy canes and stuff. And holiday bu bundles is a really good idea if you're planning to sell um, holiday bundles on Amazon. They sell like hotcakes. And the whole idea is to make sure that people are thinking that your products can be gifted to someone. So of course, um, you know, you have to create that uh, psychology and that brand image in uh, people's minds. So holiday bundles do a great job. And yeah, a special holiday discounts also do a great job. So make sure that you are um, learning from, you know, beneath here and um, implementing. Oh, I learned something from you as well. Like I, I didn't know, I didn't know you could do the, the holiday cap on the deodorant. I, I thought you were supposed to have a clean thing, but yeah, that's a great idea. Maybe I'll go try it out on there. Yeah, no, you can innovate in your product videos as well. So yeah, mm -hmm. thank you so much, Vineet. Yeah, and I mean, if we see Native uh, with their deodorants wearing like a Santa hat, the, um, you guys know that it's coming from me. It's so, um, <laughs> Sarah, uh, and Rhea have given that idea. <laughs>